Hello, everyone, and welcome back. Today is Wednesday, April the 1st, and we're going to talk a little bit about French neoclassicist theater. All right, so let me just share my screen with you. All right, so I'm going to minimize myself again. So the Renaissance basically arrives late in France. So late 16th century, early 17th century. The word neoclassicism merely re refers to a renewed interest in classical Greek and Roman works. An emphasis was placed on balance, harmony, elegance of line, dignity of, dignity of design, excuse me. And this movement stimulated architecture, painting, sculpture, clothing, and even garden design. One of the big things to remember about theater at this time is that we see a lot of rules being placed on theater. So, and mainly the organization that was responsible for this was the Académie Française. This was established in 1635 and it was basically to protect the French from corruption and foreign influences. And they become the style police in dramatic literature. New plays had to be submitted for approval, much like in Greece, before they could be produced, and censorship was part of the process. And as a result, playwriting becomes academic, rigid, mechanical. Now, a few of the most important restrictions to remember that were placed on playwrights at the time are the unities, and this is the action of the play. So this means that the action of the play had to take place in a maximum of 24 hours using only one location and telling one story on a classical theme. Comedy and tragedy were strictly separated, with tragedy being the higher art. Comedy had to be in prose, tragedy in verse, absolutely no exceptions. We also have a big word here called verisimilitude. This simply means believability. This meant no flights of imagination, no mysterious or unexplained events. Characters had to be consistent at all times. Um, with this also, you know, good characters were rewarded, bad characters were punished. Very simple distinction there. Also decorum, a sense of di dignity and restraint had to be employed. The, rationale, the rational was to be celebrated, the irrational eliminated. And going back to Aristotelian structure, or as Aristotle wrote about in the Poetics, a play had to have five acts with a focus on a steady plot progression. And also along with decorum, they very much subscribed to Horace's way of looking at theater. So Horace was the, the, the guy who we talked about who had written Ars Poetica, or the Art of Poetry. And he said that theater, the purpose of theater, was to teach and to please. And the French very much believed in that. And as for the five act structure, um, Aristotle really, that was more of a suggestion than an absolute guideline and a rule. And the French definitely made it a rule. So we see two major playwrights here, uh, Pierre Cornet and Jean Racine. A very important play from Cornet called Le Cid. This is an enormous popular success, but it drew the criticism of the Academy, uh, which declared it defective and ignited a bitter debate among the literary elite of Paris. So it must have been very frustrating for Cornet because here he had a very, uh, very popular, very entertaining play that was criticized by the elite because it didn't follow the rules, uh, didn't follow the verisimilitude, uh, the unities, all of those rules that they had set up. So from there on out, uh, Cornet continues to write about the repression of passion in favor of duty. So he, you know, obviously he, he really was, this really bothered him, the fact that he was pouring his heart and soul into this and it was being criticized. Uh, just simply because it didn't follow the rules. Uh, Jean Racine, um, he achieved fame and fortune with his uh, third tragedy. Um, this earned him, earned him the patronage of King Louis XIV, and he becomes a very important figure uh, uh, in terms of, also with Moliere, who definitely features him as, uh, sometimes he's even as a main character in some of his plays. So if you could, the, the, the the moral of the story is that if you can gain favor of royalty as a playwright, then you're in pretty good shape. Your career will definitely um, be, you know, will we'll move up because of that. So Moliere, uh, he starts to adapt uh, the 
art of commedia del, commedia del arte, which we talked about in Italian theater, Italian Renaissance. He starts to work that into his plays. And he's the second most produced playwright in the West. He often used commedia elements in his work. And there are three important influences that make Moliere's work unique. He managed to work within this neoclassical framework and still write comedy. Uh, he employs the very broadest comic and improvisational ingredients in performance. And Moliere was strongly influenced by uh, King Louis XIV, the monarch, with a love for pageantry, laughter, and dancing. And I think, yeah, and to repeat that again, you know, a very important reason why Moliere was so important was because he was able to work within those roles and still write comedy uh, that was both popular and entertaining. And he also was able to elevate the, the, the status of comedy, whereas for a while it was tragedy was considered the more noble art form and comedy was really considered the lesser art form. He really elevated comedy and, and made it a serious form of theater. So again, he writes out of the commedia tradition, employs the basic elements of comedy and improvisation and performance. And uh, again, he adds sophistication and precision to the tradition of commedia. And he very much uh, is, he continues to entertain King Louis throughout his life. Um, he, Moliere spent much of the rest of his life creating plays interspersed with music and dancing, featuring the king who loved to make guest appearances. And he had entertained the king since the king was two years old uh, at the Louvre in 1658. Moliere managed to serve oppressive rulers such as King Louis and observe strict guidelines, all writing strong and lasting satire in the process. All right, so just a couple things about the um, actual theaters at the time, the buildings in which these plays were performed. We have something, uh, a place called the Hotel de Bourgogne, the only permanent theater in Paris. The alternative was a tennis court. So we see the emergence of tennis court theaters. Estimates of the number of courts in Paris in the 17th century raised from two, range from 250 to 1800. And um, we'll see, uh, to, you know, to convert a tennis court into a theater, you really just had to add a platform and shift the seats around a little bit. And this really became the first choice of actors seeking buildings to convert into theaters. And we'll see the way in which that was done. Uh, first show you a picture of the Hotel de Bourgogne. So this was used up until 1629. And then this is a typical French tennis court here in its classic configuration. And then this is shifted around uh, to be a theater. So we see the addition of a platform over there at the right and uh, the seats have been shifted a bit. So it kind of looks like a modern day gymnasium. All right, so that is it uh, for tennis court theater. So um, for next week, or sorry, for French neoclassicism, but it is important to remember uh, tennis court theater um, as being one of the most uh, popular ways to uh, produce plays at that point in the 17th century in France. So for next week, uh, we're going to be talking about English restoration and remember to read the Rover and post your IR. And as for uh, commenting on guest teacher pr presentations, remember to do that by this Sunday, I think it's April the 5th by midnight. All right, everybody have a great week and I'll uh, see you next week.